Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to Guiding Star Astrology. It's so wonderful to have you join us, and it's wonderful to have David Warner Matheson with us today once again, here to share all about some special things that he's been up to recently. David, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for inviting me, Ksenia. It's great to be here. Good to have you back. And you've been busy over the last couple of months getting a, um, well, launching a very special course. And I've been busy doing the same thing. So we actually, David and I had a discussion and thought it'd be good if we did a video where we talked about what we've been up to regarding these courses. But do you want to tell us a little bit about this particular course that you've just released? Sure. Well, thank you and congratulations on your course and thanks for inviting me back and uh, to talk about this new course. So the way I like to start is by asking, can the stars point us back to our authentic self? And that may seem like a puzzling question. What are, what are you talking about? But cutting edge, modern healers and therapists describe trauma as a separation from our own self, from our own authentic self, usually as a result of some deep injury. And we separate from our authentic, who we really are in order to fit in or to avoid um, some kind of consequence or as a result of attachment injury, some psychologists call it, but they define trauma as a separation from self yeah. And it's so painful that we even suppress the memory that we've done it or the possibility that that could have happened to us because we don't want to bring up that pain. So and does it have to be like what you're referring to something really like significant, like, you know, sexual abuse as a child or something, or could it be like, you know, something that everybody goes through that traumatizes us, like maybe getting bullied a bit at school or something. Right. To, to, I'm not a psychologist. I try and make that clear. I'm a star myth explorer, but the psychologists that I listen to, like Dr. Gabor Mate talks a lot about this. Dr. Richard Schwartz talks about there is a central self that we, that we have, that we all have, but it can be from it can be from the kinds of trauma that you're talking about, physical abuse, emotional abuse, deliberate abuse, sexual abuse, but it could also be um, from situations that are nobody's fault, mm -hmm. so to speak. You know, parents are doing their best in this society that we're living in where there's all kinds of economic pressures and attachment injury means you're really, really attached to your parents. That's natural, that's the way when you're two years old, it's a survival mechanism. We're programmed to attach to our parents, just like little ducks yes. follow the, the mama duck around. That is a survival mechanism because there's no two-year-old, no matter how tough they are, that can survive in this world yeah. by themselves, uh, at least in the human species, the two-year-old elephant maybe, or actually that's not a good example. Elephant has a longer... <laughs> longer okay. attachment but it may be a two-year-old you know tiger or a two-year-old bull yeah. that's okay but a two-year-old person cannot make it in the world so we attach to our parents and it's natural and our parents naturally are programmed to love and attach to their children but there may be a you know your your mom has to work because of the economic situation and you're put in child care and you don't understand why or your dad comes home from a busy you know something that is at work or whatever that's really bothering him has nothing to do with you and he's you know yelling at the tv screen in a violent way and you're as a two-year-old, you're saying, mm, this world that I live in, which is, I'm so dependent on my parents. You're not saying this consciously, but this is yeah. what happens. My dad is normally nice and loving and caring. And every now and then he's like an unguided missile and uh, terrifying. And that is terrifying to a little child who's trying to process the world and attach to it his or her parents. And the psychologists explain that 
it is a defense mechanism because it's so scary to say my dad is unhinged, mm -hmm. right? My whole world centers around my dad and my mom and they're unhinged, they're erratic, they're unpredictable. There's nothing I can do about it. It has nothing to do with me. Um, instead, what we do, what we're already innately programmed to do is say, I must have caused this problem or because then you can control it. Oh, I've done something. Maybe if I blank, that won't happen. Mm -hmm. This is just an example of where someone's That's not it. trying to hurt you. Yeah. They're just they've got pressures on them. They had issues with their parents, whatever. They're trying to do their very best or they were in the army. And <laughs> that, that applies to me. They, they picked up some habits in the army, some ways of talking. And you say, if I blank, 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 then maybe dad won't do this or maybe mom won't do that. Mm -hmm. And you, for, you, you turn it inwards because that's actually less scary than I live in a universe where I can't control anything. Yeah. So you suppress certain things. Well, I did this, maybe that triggered dad, or I showed this characteristic and I got yelled at and you suppress that. Or maybe it happened at school, like you mentioned. There's all kinds of things in this society. It's not a necessarily nurturing society it's, and it's getting worse. Mm. So what if I told you that there was an ancient body of wisdom that was given to cultures around the world, all cultures around the world, that actually illustrates that we're in this condition? Because we suppress, it's so painful, we suppress the idea that we've even buried and suppressed our authentic self. That's, that's a painful thing to do. And so when someone starts talking about authentic self, there's a defense, it's, it's done as a defense mechanism. So that defense mechanism jumps in and says, what, authentic self buried under the floorboards? No <laughs> officer, there isn't one. See, it, it, and we resist when someone comes up to us and says, how's your relationship with your higher self? We say, don't give me that new age crap or whatever, because that's a defense mechanism. But what if there was a, a system, an ancient system of knowledge that illustrates that this has happened to us and brings it to our awareness and even better points us towards renewing mm. and recovering that relationship with who we are that's that's my uh that's my introduction to it's what amazing. i'm talking about <laughs> amazing so i'm taking it that your course is all about this topic which is so exciting it's, it's a topic that we all, that's what we're all really longing for. When we go to the movies and when we watch this, you know, drama play out where tension gets more and more and more tension. And then at the end, oh, it's all resolved. Or at least, you know, in some movies, it is. <laughs> that's what we're, that's what we're actually searching for. A lot of times we search for the answer outside of ourself in some kind of, you know, drinking or a relationship. Oh, maybe if I meet this person and that will save me. But actually what we're really looking for is that recovery of self. And so to answer your question, what my courses are all about, if there was this ancient system, I'd be really excited to learn about it. And what I've spent the last 12 plus years researching is the evidence that there is just such a very uh, worldwide system. And it's preserved in these myths, these ancient sacred stories that are given to every culture around the world. There's these sacred traditions and sacred stories and some cultures wrote them down as sacred scriptures, but in the ancient myths, scriptures and sacred stories, they are metaphorical and they are showing us these lessons in a dramatic metaphor, but it's really about us. Why and that's what I've been researching. Uh, and you have a master's of English literature, David. So why do you think it is that this system has been preserved in the form of mythological metaphor? Well, that's such a great question. And the answer, the really honest answer is we don't know because anyone who claims to know, we have to ask them, you know, what time travel technique they have because <laughs> this <laughs> is so ancient that it's already present in the myths of ancient Egypt. 
the earliest myths of ancient Egypt that we have written down, like the pyramid texts, are already talking about Osiris and Horus. And the earliest myths from ancient Mesopotamia are already using this system. I can show it in the myths of Gilgamesh and Enkidu and the other Sumerian myths, the goddess Inanna, who goes down to the underworld. That's a story of trauma and suppression. Yeah. But she comes back. She comes back. And who um, knows how long those myths had been around before they were written down in the period. Uh, that's right. Uh, I mean, I'll give you my speculation in a minute, but I'm, <laughs> I'm just setting up the scene. The myths of ancient India, very, very ancient. The Vedas, right, are very ancient. The stories of the cultures of Australia. You're in Australia. The indigenous mm -hmm. Aboriginal cultures of Australia are extremely ancient, 50,000 years, 60,000 years, incredible. And they have sacred traditions about the dream time and the creation and about you know the fisherman who uh, tries to pursue this fish across the, uh, across the land and tries to spear the fish that its eyes are glowing from under the water. And these, sacred traditions in Africa, the, the, the sacred stories of the cultures of Africa, the many different cultures of Africa in the Americas. So it's very, very ancient. So the answer that I give is I don't know, but I suspect it has to do with what I said about that defense mechanism. We suppress, we have defense mechanisms for our own survival. These are, these are part of our makeup because it helps us to survive these other parts of who we are, to use some of the terminology that a psychologist, pioneering, wonderful psychologist named Dr. Richard Schwartz talks about in internal family systems. We all have these different parts of our personality of who we are. And astrology uh, certainly you know, talks about this. Well, you have this component and this component. Um, they are playing roles to try and survive. It's like, we got to keep this system together. Things aren't perfect. And it's like the kids are in a house. Dr. Richard Schwartz uses this me metaphor where let's say the parent has died, the mother has died or the father has died and the oldest daughter tries to take on that role or the oldest son tries to be the father, but he's only nine. Mm -hmm. So he does his best. He doesn't exactly know what... Uh, you know, a 30 year old father would know. He's just nine. He doesn't know the world, but he's trying. He's trying to show those other kids, I do know I can be like dad that's gone and left us in this lurch. Well, that's the situation that we're in with parts of us trying their best to cope after they've given up hope on the self that actually knows. It's like the self is like the one that actually knows. Yeah. I call it like the coach on a on a professional basketball team, but the, the players have lost trust in their coach and locked him or her underneath the court. And now they're trying to play the game by themselves. Anyway, they suppress, they're, they're trying to cope to survive and they suppress the fact that that's happened. And so the myths using this drama in this story, bypass those guardians, those mm -hmm. protecting parts. They're, they're trying their best. They're doing it for a allegedly, you know, theoretically positive purpose, although they can be self-sabotaging and they yeah. don't know that they're screwing things up. And they're like, no, 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 no. I don't think talk everybody... to me about what happened. Everyone yeah. can identify with the whole self-sabotaging thing, which, you know, we're doing, doing what we think is best for us to protect ourselves, And I, and that's a mm -hmm. perfect imagery of what you're talking about. Sorry, interrupted mm -hmm. again. Go on. No, no, no. I went, I was going on and on. You rescued me from rolling down the <laughs> hill too far, but um, the, the, the answer to your question, A, we don't know, but B, I suspect it's sheer genius because they're bypassing the kind of the critical mind and going to the story and showing it to us and then if you understand what they're trying to say then all of a sudden you can go oh oh that's what i'm doing oh yeah. that's that's actually my situation mm -hmm. and it's like a boom it's like a, a a light bulb moment and that is the what is called the esoteric yeah. the esoteric means it's not that the message is hidden it is hidden but it's hidden 
because it's bypassing the brain hidden in plain more, sight more metaphor yeah. yeah and going to the heart mm. so you understand it on a deeper deeper level yeah. and then your brain goes and then someone says you know what you just heard no what is it well that's actually a story of you what do you mean well blah 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 oh and you have that boom that's a like a knowing that's deeper yeah so i believe that's what they're doing great I question it. I love it. And, and as human beings, we're very geared to storytelling, like from our earliest childhood, we're, re, we're you know, learning, reading storybooks. And, Absolutely. and we have as fairy adults, tales. fairy tales and film, um, you know, and, and things, I don't know, if, uh, this is just a bit of astrology here, but particularly people who have the sign of Mercury, which is how we learn mm -hmm. and how we communicate in a, in a water sign, particularly in the sign of cancer, those people respond best to emotional um, learning. And how do we receive emotion-based learning? It's through the, the storytelling, the emotive experience that a story brings, you know. And so particularly those people would respond very well <laughs> to what you're talking about, but it's a big part of everyone really to appreciate and value story as a learning mechanism. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's really, really interesting. And, and so- That's beautiful. Let me just interrupt you. For sure, Keep that please. thought, don't forget it. But Mercury is the messenger of the gods. I mean, I know you know that, but I'll just like flesh it out a little bit. And these stories, are like they're given to us from the realm of the divine mm -hmm. and they were held in tremendous reverence in all these different cultures around the world because it's like a message from the gods for us or from the divine realm um we're, we'll talk about my latest course which is the stories of the bible the bible is part of the same tradition it is using the same metaphorical system and the way i can prove that it's metaphor is it's actually based on the stars the figures and the events are based on specific constellations including many of them zodiac constellations and heavenly cycles which astrology is dealing with cycles you just yeah. mentioned mercury has a cycle of course, the sun has a cycle, the moon has a cycle. And so this incredible system, where did it come from? I don't know. The gods, the divine realm. I mean, it's beyond, it's so profound. Yeah. They use this system like a language or like a code, like a coded language to convey to us these truths about powerful profound things that we need even today in this modern world including this situation of separation from self that's a central central theme in the bible and in the stories of the world sorry well, I, I interrupted you but you know. brought up mercury and i just wanted to yeah it's like the, the divine realm has given this to us the message mm. we've got to listen to it or it would be wise to listen to it, or maybe we would want to listen to it. Yeah. So it's really interesting to me, David, that, you know, in mythologies, I've always questioned, why are these gods so ungodlike, if you know what I mean? Like they're, they're wild and they're debaucherous sometimes. And, and you know, they're, um, and, and from what you're describing here, the, you know, even the Bible, like there's, there's polygamy in the Bible. Why? You know, like that's not considered to be a, an acceptable mode these days. And so, so you know, we've got all these uh, discrepancies in this, you know, godlike behavior. And this describes it because as human beings, we have a, a human, you know, worldly experience that's um, not not clear cut and it's not always good and shining and golden and and the myths are reflecting that even though they're talking about the divine beings you know who are seem to be in my opinion just reading about the gods quite fallible just like we human beings are would you say absolutely and we have i mean you I don't, i'm not an expert in astrology but you talk about Mars is here and Mars has these characteristics and Mars is sometimes impetuous and mm -hmm. sometimes violent. He has and a shadow have, side and a light right. side. Yeah. And we have that. Mm -hmm. And so these, um, 
these aspects that we see in the myths are in the divine realm reflecting what we have going on right here inside of our own experience. And psychologically, you could say, well, of course, the, the myths are going to reflect, you know, it's like the, it's like a fractal or as above, so below. What we experience is also going on in the invisible realms, if you believe in invisible realms, which I most people watching this that's channel. That's a very, yeah, that's a very um, helpful way of understanding it, whether that's mm. exactly what's going on. There is something that is beyond physics that yeah. we can talk, you know, about evidence for. I like to say, your friend in Texas that you've never spoken with for two or three years, you just happen to be thinking about them and saying, oh, I wonder, oh, I think I'll give such and such a call today. And then the phone rings and it's them. Mm. How did that happen? There's no physics that can explain that. There's some kind of, you know, you're seven states away or you're across an ocean away and yet that happens. And those who just say, well, there's no such thing as an invisible realm or it's all physics, you know, have to fall back on coincidence. Oh, yeah. just a coincidence. Well, there's some coincidences that just go beyond, uh, you know, really <laughs> rational belief. It's like you're getting a little bit overboard in your faith and coincidences at, at yeah. some point. But um, I like that word because it is faith in a coincidence, you that's know. Right. You know that's right. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that divine realm, that invisible realm has uh, or reflects, you know, there's things that go on, the things that go on inside our heads are also playing out inside society on a larger scale. Mm. And they're also playing out inside of nature. And then they're playing out inside the divine realm. So um, yeah, the gods and actually Augustine or Augustine, some people pronounce it Augustine, who's a church father, wrote a book called The City of God and other treatises where he was arguing, he was living in the Roman Empire and he was arguing against the gods and for faith in the Bible. And, and I've written about this in one of my books. And he says, you know, look at your gods. They're, they're crazy. They're ridiculous. Look at Zeus or Jupiter, who's always going down and, you know, lusting after mortal women and, and sleeping with them. And, you know, how can anyone believe in gods like that? We have the Bible, which doesn't have that. And my counter to that is, the Bible is actually based on the exact same system, mm. but for the most part, the characters are human. So mm. David, <laughs> after whom I am named, David in the Bible is actually lined up with the very same constellation as Zeus. And you can show that. And Zeus is always looking down from Olympus and saying, Hmm, I think I want to sleep with that queen of Sparta. Man, she is hot. And um, David in the Bible does the same thing from the top of a roof. He looks down and sees Bathsheba and says, hey, I'm the king. <laughs> you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to figure out how to get together with her. And so Augustine, or if you prefer Augustine, was saying, see, we don't have all that in our Bible, those fallacies and, you know, human foibles among the gods. Well, you've got it playing out with characters like David or Samson or Solomon or, uh, you know, the 12 disciples, just like the 12 gods of Olympus. They have different characteristics. Peter is impetuous. Thomas is stubborn or he's also impetuous and doubting. All these different aspects of who we are, the stories are not about literal David, literal Samson, literal Solomon. They're about us. They're about us. And people like to say, well, okay, yeah, they're about us. But couldn't they also be about literal historical figures? They could. But what I'm going to show you, I'll show you, you know, in my courses, I show that they're based on the stars. They are metaphorically 
based on the stars and we'll see that and i've got a little presentation whenever you're ready i can yeah pull up yeah. some visuals i'm to show you to... what i mean by based on the stars i'm so keen to get into the presentation that you have but i just want to clarify for those of us who are watching and wondering you know is this course for me well um I know that a lot of my viewers have come and a lot of people moving into astrology have come out of a very religious context um, and they've discovered the truth in astrology. So it would seem to me that the, the, the course, which is, and I've, correct me if I've got the title wrong here, Celestial Bible Tour Part One. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So absolutely right. you you're it. going through the stories of the Bible bit by bit and explaining how they're celestial metaphor. That would be so pertinent to anybody coming out of a religious background, but also anybody searching for like an example of how the, the myths relate to the search for the higher self and to reinstate the higher self. Would that be right? Absolutely. That is the central theme that I tie the interpretation to. Mm -hmm. the, the myths are profound. They are operating on many, many levels. They are very deep. They have a lot to teach us. But for sure, if it's not the central theme, it is one of the central themes is this separation from self and guiding us towards recovery of self. And I like what you said because I myself have come out of literal, literalistic understanding of the Bible. I was extremely literalistic in my understanding of the Bible. I was not looking for evidence that was going to rock my world and change my whole perspective. I was taking the Bible literally, and I thought that that meant I was, you know, respecting it the most. And when I started to see evidence that it wasn't, or that it could be based on celestial metaphor, the, the, the immediate response is, well, no, I know that it's true. So it can't be based on celestial metaphor. It's like, wait a minute, it, something has to be literal in order to be true. That's, that's the, the false uh, assumption that we have. When, when I tell somebody the story of Samson, which I'll show you a little bit about Samson, because that was the first one. I decided to use Samson because it's the first one that I really started to see. Well, wait a minute. I know that Samson must have been a literal strongest man in the world. Don't tell me that it's metaphorical. Don't tell me that it's not true. Well, the, the counter to that is who told you that it has to be literal in order to be true? It is true. It is full of profound truth for our lives. All these stories are true. But that doesn't mean, I would argue, they're not literal. They don't have to be literal to be true. So um, let's let's yeah. dive into this Samson yeah. story then. If yeah, you're yeah, ready. We, we will. And and but the, the the last point I just wanted to touch on that you brought up is you know astrology. People who have come to astrology and found, wow, I I see truth here, mm. and yet I was told mm. that that's evil or that that's false or that that's there has been a lot of ancient wisdom that has been given or preserved among humanity that has been kicked out or uh, marginalized because of a literalistic interpretation and the ancients didn't I can find some evidence to argue the ancients didn't see this as literalistic they saw it they didn't have a problem with it being metaphor the example i like to use is achilles do you know the story of achilles yeah how he's invulnerable his mother was like she was a goddess actually so she, she but she had a, a son by a mortal man so she said well he's he's gonna be heroic but he's mortal huh. how can i make him immortal well how did she make him immortal do you know? She dipped him into something by holding his ankle. Yeah, um, his Achilles I, I, tendon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So what did she dip? You said into something. something. I was, I'm thinking a river there, or mm, I can't remember different, what it was. <laughs> yeah, the reason, the reason maybe you're a little ambiguous on it is there's different versions of the story. There's Achilles was dipped into the river Styx in one version. And so where she held his ankle or his heel, his Achilles tendon, that's why we still call it the Achilles, was covered by her hand and it didn't get the 
special water. And so he was vulnerable at just that one point. But in other versions, in fact, more of the ancient versions, he was dipped into a fire. And then when her husband, her mortal husband came in and said, what are you doing? You're dipping our son in the fire. He rushed over and, you know, grabbed the baby out. And these are like myths where the baby is going to be given immortality, but doesn't quite make it, doesn't quite get immortality. And Achilles does, no spoilers, but he dies in the Trojan War for those, <laughs> of, those who haven't heard um, because of that. And, but this is a pattern around the world of the baby who's going to be made immortal, but somehow the parents mess it up somehow. Baby Maui actually goes through a similar, there's a similar story for baby Maui, who is a divine or a semi-divine hero in the cultures of the Pacific, all the way to New Zealand, all the way to Hawaii, all the way to Easter Island, the hero Maui, his parents mess up uh, an immortality ritual as well, just like Achilles. But the point, I, I'm getting off topic. The point is, we don't find records of ancient, um, you know, religious wars between the, the groups that held that Achilles was dipped in a river and the groups that held that Achilles was dipped in a fire. You know, we don't find people being intolerant of one another. Hey, what do you think about Achilles? Fire <laughs> or river sticks? <laughs> River sticks. Oh, I'm gonna kill you. No, they, we don't see that because it, they, it's a metaphor. It's a myth. There's many different versions of these myths, and I think it's the same thing for the Bible. There was an understanding, an esoteric, some people say a Gnostic understanding, and then later the literalists came in and clamped down on it, yeah. and they for a lot of ancient wisdom became forbidden, including potentially wisdom that now had to go underground like astrology, Absolutely. oracle, yeah. divination, you know, things like tarot or consulting. How do I find the will of the gods? All ancient cultures, including the stories in the Bible, have discussion of divination. You see mm -hmm. drawing and that's really what a lot, sorry to interrupt. Lots in the Bible, in the Old Testament stories. Sorry to interrupt, Pardon David, me? but that's no. really what like yeah, oracle no. cards and tarot cards yes. are all about. They're tapping into your higher knowing, your higher self. Um, it, it, it's not like it's outside of you. It's your energy in the oracle card pulling up for you what you need to hear in that moment. So again, it's a similar, exactly what you're talking about, that coming back to self and, and because we're quite disconnected from self, we use these mechanisms to bring us back to, okay, well, what, what's the message in, in this for me? Astrology is like that too. And, and the wisdom of Plato or whoever put that adage on the temple at Delphi, to know thyself, that's what it's all about, you know, to get back in touch with the self. That's what astrology is doing. That is what the tarot and the oracle cards and so on are doing and that's what you're doing and that's why I just I love what you're doing I love the work that you're producing and um, I'm so excited about this course that you're releasing um, Celestial Bible Tour um, which we've got a link for in the description below if people want to sign up and learn some of this fabulous information about the stories of the Bible and how they are celestial metaphor that applies to your life um, I've actually done one of David's courses myself, and I just cannot recommend his teaching highly enough. So do check it <laughs> I out. Really, I really appreciate it. <laughs> I appreciate those, those positive feedback. I mean, it's gratifying to hear and, and what you're doing, and we should talk about Royal Stars Academy. It's knowing yourself. Yeah. I think, you know, it's like when you pull that rune or that oracle card and you're like, Hmm. You know, I really already knew that. I just, yeah. you know, and that's what it's it, the higher self. You can call it many different things, but that self is the interface, I believe, with the divine realm. So we we get those messages. The more we're in tune with self, the more we're able to hear. Yes, those messages, that truth. And that's one of the reasons, David, why I've produced the Royal Stars Academy myself, because that's what I really want to do is teach people how to 
how to know astrology, which is a mechanism for understanding self you know i mean i can do readings all day every day until the cows come home as they say um but the the real help in a person's life is going to come when you know how to do it yourself and you can just make choices in the moment based on okay i understand myself i know myself and i and the cycles that i'm in boom i make a decision because i know in my case my astrology so um, hence, I would encourage everyone to also check out the Royal Stars Academy <laughs> so that you can learn astrology with me because it will take you just so much deeper into knowing yourself and empower you in a way that any other astrologer cannot do. You are your best astrologer, basically, once you know um, how to work with the uh, heavenly language of the stars. I love that you said that because that's the same. I mean, at the, at the risk of making this into just a mutual... Uh, you know, packing back, yeah, yeah. Mutual, patting your back mutual, session <laughs> self-patting on the back session that is the the point of these ancient scriptures are given for our benefit and blessing and they've been interpreted for us by mm. interpreters who don't necessarily speak the language that they're speaking and so being able to go to them and listen, instead of listening to me, you know, I, I can, inter like you said, till the cows come home, I can interpret myths for you. But as you start to learn this language, you can go to any myth you want and consult it. I will say that some are trickier than others or some are more obscure than others. Um, but there's very clear evidence that they're based on the stars. So. I'll show, I mean, I keep saying based on the stars and people who maybe seen some of our previous interviews or some of my other work may know what I'm talking about, but to show what that is, I'll share um, some of this, some of the visuals to really try and bring it home to people if, if you're ready for that. I'm so ready. I'm really excited about this one because I've always loved the story of Samson myself. So very keen to see what you have to share. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe I'm just a bit odd but I grew up listening to Neil Sedaka a lot in his story song about <laughs> Samson and Delilah as a kid I'd sing around the house all day so very very keen on this one I'll let you take over from here great well I'll share my screen but the reason I chose this so we'll talk about the Undying Stars Academy let me pull up the let me pull up the screen but as I started off by asking can the stars point you back to your authentic self that's the whole premise of the Undying Stars Academy. So, like I said, I've been at this for over 12 years and I've written many books totaling over 5,000 pages. So they're, they're pretty big books and they have a lot of diagrams and they have a lot of star charts, but the star charts don't move on the page. <laughs> um, and you've got to read my description and refer to it. So I've now created the Undying Stars Academy, which is visual video courses in the ancient system that underlies the world's myths. And some people call it astrotheology. I don't know if everyone's familiar with that term. I don't always use that term. I like star myths, but the Undying Stars, my second book was called The Undying Stars. It has a reference to ancient Egypt. The Undying Stars Academy is now building a library of courses for people to really take, it's like college level courses of me talking with visual animation and graphics. And I've started out with two foundations courses. I'll talk about those a little bit, but the one that I'm just releasing now is, well, actually I'll, I'll just quickly show those. This is the, the two foundations courses that have been out for a little while now, these are trying to explain the outlines of this system, how it works, what these heavenly cycles are about that I'm, when I say the stars, the, the Bible stories or the myths of ancient Greece or the myths of ancient India are based on the stars and the heavenly cycles. What are those heavenly cycles? So the first of the foundations courses that I made was called Celestial Mechanics and the Myths. It's wonderful. Yeah, you, I did that one. That. that was great. Yeah. 
and it's explaining the outlines and the mechanisms of the system and then recovering our deeper self which is talking about just what we've been talking about and relating it to these heavenly cycles and how this system works giving the foundations and now from there i want to build applications where we dive into the applications courses are going into the specific myths of a culture a single culture like the greek myths or the myths of ancient egypt or the myths of ancient mesopotamia but i started with the bible because the bible is so pervasive it's soaked through western culture for sure i mean the the myths of ancient india are definitely very much still alive and well known in india the mahabharata and i am looking forward to doing a course on the myths of ancient india or the mahabharata or the different um, myths of ancient china and japan and all the other cultures and so there's many more to come but the first of the applications courses building on these foundations is the um the celestial bible tour that that we're going to talk about so um let me go back to my sharing this visual can you see it yeah great so i decided to sh to show this the part one like the bible's so big that this is going to be multiple courses part one goes from the garden of eden adam and eve the serpent gets into the story of cain and abel and seth the children of Adam and Eve, goes through the Genesis flood, goes through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Um, but I thought I'm going to illustrate with a story that's not in this course, the Samson story, because it was my first one. It was my first one. So here's Samson. You when you there? say your first one, your first. Oh, <laughs> right. So I was taking the Bible literally uh -huh. in 2012. And um, it was actually in 2009 that this happened. By 2012, I'd found enough evidence. This is when my transition really started happening. But in 2009, my parents went to Machu Picchu and I got my mother a book for her birthday because she was going to Machu Picchu by Graham Hancock and his wife, Santa Faya, called Heaven's Mirror. And in that book, Graham Hancock and so I gave it to my mother, but then I was like, who is this Graham Hancock? You know, he's very fascinating. I'm really interested in this. And I started watching his videos and, and he's and wonderful. Buying his books. Yeah. But, and I bought, you know, fingerprints of the gods. And in his books, he refers to this text called Hamlet's Mill, which we'll get to in just one second. And they talk about Samson. So I was believing the Bible literally, but I grew up loving the stars even when i was a child my dad i think i've mentioned this on the show before so i won't repeat it now but i grew up loving the constellations i grew up loving the myths i even taught you know the odyssey at west point i was very into the myths but i was taking the bible literally i thought that's the way you took it and so when i read hamlet's mill which we'll get to in a second and they talked about the myths being based on the stars well i love the myths I love the stars. I'm all ears. I, I want to know more. I'm, I'm thirsty for this knowledge. But when they mention Bible stories being based on the stars, I'm very resistant. You know, those defense mechanisms are popping up. I'm like, well, okay, maybe the myths of ancient Greece, but not Samson. I know Samson is literal. So here's a painting of Samson. I'll just put the different painters up so you can kind of see the... I love how you include of. art in your courses, David, and it's quite fascinating how art very much reflects exactly what you're Isn't trying it? to yeah we'll see some yeah. of that we'll see some of that so this one's from the 1800s obviously this this artist joaquin i can't see it because there's something underneath my uh but he lived in the 1800s is a powerful look at samson but what's what's he got there in his hand he's got one hand is kind of in a fist the other hand is holding something kind of flat looking and covered with blood on one edge what is that Anyone who knows the Bible would know. <laughs> you know. It's a jawbone you know. of a donkey. <laughs> a jawbone, the famous jawbone of an ass. So here's Hamlet's Mill. That was published in 1969. And in Hamlet's Mill, they mostly are talking about this 
ancient system and it's a profound ancient system and it goes through the myths of the world and fairy tales and rituals and other pieces of wisdom that we've forgotten, but especially myth. And they talk about Greek myth and they talk about myths of ancient India and they talk about myths from around the world, but they also once in a while mention stories in the Bible, which I'd be, I, I would bristle at a little bit, but they have this chapter, an entire chapter devoted to Samson called Samson Under Many Skies. And they start off, that's, this is page 165, chapter 11. They start off with this proclamation, which I was none too you know, open, <laughs> open to, none too pleased about. The story of Samson stands out in the Bible as a grand tissue of absurdities it's like it's it's not it doesn't even hold together very well it's kind of like tissue paper and yeah. it tears apart sunday school pupils must long have been puzzled about his weapon for killing philistines but there's so much more to puzzle about that's puzzling but everything about it is puzzling yes yes and they quote a little bit here this is actually from judges 15 as they put right there and i just highlight this first verse uh, from 1515 and he found a new jawbone of an ass and put forth his hand and took it and slew a thousand men therewith and it goes on and samson said with the jawbone of an ass heaps upon heaps with the jaw of an ass i have slain a thousand men now let's just think about that if it's literal he was in a pinch he was is actually you know there's some context to the story which maybe we'll get into later um, he's being he's being tied up and given over to the Philistines because he set loose a bunch of foxes to burn up their cornfields, their wheat fields, in an act of kind of spite and revenge. He's angry because his riddle got solved. We'll get into his riddle, but so actually the other his other countrymen tie him up because they're like, hey, the Philistines are mad. Why are they mad? Because you burned up their crops. You knucklehead we're going to turn you over to them and he says well as long as you don't kill me and they say well we won't but we're giving you over to the philistines and they tie him up and of course samson's strongest man just bursts the ropes when he gets to the philistines grabs the jawbone of an ass and starts killing okay so we can understand he was tied up he didn't exactly have a sword he grabs the jawbone but then he kills how many a thousand, a thousand? like Look at that jawbone. It's just still going strong. Like after maybe clubbing a hundred people to death with that jawbone, wouldn't it start to come apart? Mm -hmm. I mean, and look at on the ground. Some of these guys have swords. Mm -hmm. Would you not like after maybe 50, throw the jawbone down and grab a sword and start killing instead? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not literal. It's, I mean, it's, they're saying, look, this is absurd. Like, why would you still be killing with the jawbone after 999 mm -hmm. if there's you know weapons lying all around you uh, or wouldn't that thing fall apart like how's that jawbone holding up after that mm -hmm. many Absolutely. it is and and so they they talk about on the next page let me bring up the next page 166 they say it's not an ordinary jawbone because later he gets thirsty after he kills a thousand he says to god well i escaped my enemies but now I'm going to die of thirst. Did you let me, did you let me do all that just to die of thirst? And then God makes water come out of the jawbone. And they're saying, uh, this is not an ordinary jawbone. <laughs> like, you know, you get thirsty and it gives you some. I want water, one of those. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so they say, look, that jaw is in heaven. And then they proceed to give some celestial analysis of this passage. Like I said, at first I was very resistant to this. But the more I knew the Bible very, very well, and I knew the stars very, very well. So I'll show you their interpretation. They identify the jaw with the Hyades, which are in the zodiac constellation of Taurus. We'll see them in a minute. I'll show you. But then they talk about Marduk, a god of ancient Babylon, uses the Hyades as a boomerang like weapon. A boomerang is shaped like a jawbone. We'll see a jawbone in a minute. Um, so other myths use a jawbone. In fact, Indra of ancient India, he has a thunderbolt weapon, the Vajra, and they point out, this is all Hamlet's mill. This is like my first exposure to what has become an obsession, like my life's work. 
And frankly, Hamlet's Mill, <laughs> not to sound arrogant, but they get a lot of this wrong or they, I became obsessed with sorting this out. They, they did their best. They, they deserve tremendous credit for observing that this is going on. But I became like, Ooh, can I, can I learn more about this system? And um, some of their interpretation is, let's say questionable, but um, it's, doesn't matter because they're revealing something that is correct. And so it's for us who come afterwards to continue and they're, and they're referring to people, you know, they're not the first to notice these kinds of things. So Indra uses a jawbone. Well, they argue that Vajra, which is made from the bones of a horse headed kind of demon. So horse bones look like donkey bones. They're pretty, pretty closely related. Oh, here we have in South America where they didn't have uh, bulls and horses, the Arawaks and other native cultures of Central America and South America talk about a jaw of a taper. What's a taper? Well, it's a interesting oh. looking animal. There's one. Uh, but you can see in. how it would be similar kind of a jawbone to a horse. Yeah, yeah. Kind of horse shaped head or long, long jawbone. And uh, so we've got all these. And so they argue here, I've underlined the name of the celestial Samson is Orion, the mighty hunter. Do you agree with that? Is it? Well, I'm going to show you their interpretation. I'm going to do a whole Samson chapter in part two of celestial uh, Bible tour. Celestial Bible tour part one doesn't get as far as Samson. It gets through the children of Israel, but um, we will be doing uh, we, we've got the story of Joseph, the story of Moses, the story of Samson, the story of David, the story of Solomon. Those will all be coming in part two. But um, this argument that they make it has some strong um, evidence, which I'm going to show you. So I think they're on the right track. The fact is Samson is kind of this uh, wide ranging character. He moves through some different constellations. He's not always Orion. But let's, we'll see it in a second. I'm going to pull up some stars for your viewers to see what I'm talking about in a minute. But I'm just pointing out that around the world, we have jawbone weapons being mm-hmm. used. Here we have Maui. I referred to Maui earlier. He uses the jawbone of Muri Ranga Fanua, his own respected grandmother. Wow. wow. So, you know, he uses that as a weapon to, to beat up the sunbird that he captures. So what is going on? And they say, if one brings Samson back to earth, they're saying Samson must be celestial. If we bring him down to earth, he becomes a preposterous character or rather no character at all. It doesn't make any sense. Some of the stuff that goes on. If you're trying to take it literally terrestrial history, but if you understand that it's celestial, then it makes sense. And they have this funny quotation from uh, Sir James George Fraser, who was uh, born in Scotland, and he uses some kind of classic uh, humorous understatement here. It says, <laughs> they say, you know, he's, 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 he's no character at all, except for that he has manic violence and sudden passions. He's always <laughs> chasing after different women, and then he's going berserk and killing people. And then it says, it comes as a shock after reading that chaotic and whimsical life to find, quote, and you see it on the bottom of the other page in verse 20, and he judged Israel for 20 years. <laughs> it says, if anyone was bereft of judgment, it was this person. Yeah. <laughs> and then it says, as Fraser remarks, that's J- Sir James George Fraser who wrote The Golden Bow. One wonders, no, one doubts whether he particularly adorned the bed. I wonder if he particularly, <laughs> I wonder if he was a very, <laughs> you know, dignified judge on mm-hmm. the bench. Mm-hmm. Not, mm-hmm. not, probably not, is the point that they're making. So, so here we have the constantly, remember, they just said that Samson is Orion. Can you see Orion anywhere on your screen? Yes, down in yes. the Lower left-hand corner. Yes. Mm-hmm. Now we are in the Northern Hemisphere planetarium uh, orientation here. I've put us in 
the center of California pretty much, but can we see Orion's belt? Yes, we can. There they are, the three distinctive stars of Orion's belt, one of the most distinctive features in the night sky. If you don't know any other constellations, you probably do know Orion's belt. So here I'm gonna outline them and now I'll draw the rest of Orion. That's Orion's belt. Here comes the rest of Orion. He's actually a very powerful looking figure. Mm. He's kind of standing, you know, with his legs apart and he's got a club over his head in one hand. He's reaching forward with his other hand, sometimes envisioned as holding a bow in his other hand. He is, you know, two fisted, two weapons. He is looking like he's ready to do battle. And so in the text of the Bible itself, it says he reached out his hand and took the jawbone of an ass. Why do we have that text? He reached out his hand. I mean, does anyone think he reached out his foot to take the jawbone or he reached, you know, he grabbed it with his teeth? We, we assume they would take it in his hand because he's the constellation is reaching towards a figure and the authors of Hamlet's Mill have already argued, I'm going to show you what they're arguing, that he reaches out to take a jawbone shaped feature in the sky. And that is this V right here called the V shaped Hyades. It's an ancient Greek name for this, but it's a very distinctive. You can see this V if you know where to look, if you can find Orion. This V is part of the constellation Taurus. And it's actually, if you go from Orion's belt, it's kind of halfway between his belt and the Pleiades, which is another beautiful star cluster that plays a role in many other myths, but not this one. So the Hyades are in Taurus. I'm gonna show the two horns. You see those two fairly bright stars. Mm. So you can see why it's the jawbone of, let's say the bull of Taurus, Taurus being a bull with long horns. And so off each end of the V, you've got a horn. How could it be a donkey? Well, donkeys don't have long horns. What do they have? Long ears. <laughs> Ears, they absolutely have long ears. So sometimes in myth, Taurus has long horns like a bull, but sometimes Taurus has long ears like a donkey. And I have found, you know, the authors of Hamlet's Mill don't really go into this, but I've found other stories where Taurus actually plays a donkey, like the story of Balaam and oh. the ass or Balaam and the donkey, the do talking donkey, he's riding on a donkey and then the donkey sees an angel and so on. That's the same part of the sky going on, mm. but we won't go into that right now. So this is the jawbone is V-shaped. You know, if you trace out your own jaw, you, you'll see that it's V-shaped, but we'll see an actual um, horse jawbone here in a moment. I'll bring it up, but that's Taurus. So they are arguing that Samson reaching out his hand to take the jawbone is Orion reaching out his arm towards the Hyades. So this is how it works in the myths. And I just put up here for reference, since you are teaching astrology, you may be wondering, hmm, Taurus, that's a zodiac sign. Where's the other zodiacs in this area, other companions in the zodiac? So that's Aries right there, the three, I just drew the line. These are the three brightest that are easiest to see. These are the three that I look for when I'm looking for Aries. Aries isn't really in this story, but can you see how there's like three yes. stars there? Yes. I'm making it flash so you can see the stars. But that's just the three most visible. To see why it's a ram, this is the outline that the great mm. H.A. Ray gives us for Aries. And you can see how it looks like a little jumping sheep with a little bob tail. Yes. A little triangular head off to the right there as we, again, this is Northern Hemisphere orientation, but actually there's some very faint stars. You can see why it's a ram too. H.A. Ray doesn't draw these in, but right there are the, the stars that make up the horns. horns so yeah. Aries, yeah, sometimes it's a ram, sometimes it's a lamb. Like, you know, we have stories where a lamb is sacrificed and things like that. So that's usually associated with Aries. And then, so we have Aries, Taurus, and if you keep going to the left, you'll come to Gemini. Those are just like the bottom feet stars of Gemini over by the club of Orion. So now you're oriented to your zodiac in the sky. 
but let me just show a horse's jawbone. This is actually um, mm -hmm. a, a picture of the same jawbone from four different angles. Uh, the side, you can see, you know, how it looks like what that painting was carrying. But if you look at it from the top or the bottom, you can see how it's a very sharp V, just like the mm -hmm. Hyades. Mm -hmm. And so this is the jawbone that Orion reaches out towards. So I think that that interpretation, they just kind of throw it out there. They don't give you any diagrams in Hamlet's Mill. But, and I was like, ah, come on. But the more I studied the Bible and they throw in another one that really, uh, they talk about Revelation and the, the bottomless pit the, in Revelation 9. And when I started to see it, and because I knew the stars, it was like that plus Samson, I started to say, uh-oh, maybe they're right. Maybe, and guess what? You can go through the whole Bible and discover that it's based on the stars. But why? It's based on the stars because it's telling us something. It's metaphorical. And we are all Samson. Like just because we're not the strongest man who ever lived, this is a story about us and our passions running away with us and things like that, uh, mm -hmm. trauma and recovery of self. So let's, um, let me, so after I saw that, I'm just gonna keep kind of walking through my process of learning this. This was the next thing about Samson that they don't talk about this in Hamlet's Mill, but I knew about the Bible and I started to say, wait a minute, he goes down to meet a woman and he runs into a lion on the way. Okay, I thought that was literal, but maybe it's celestial. You know, are there any lions in the Zodiac? Are there any women in the Zodiac? It turns out that there are, we'll see in a moment. This is a painting from Francesco Hayetz, Hayetz who lived in the uh, early 1800s, 1791 to 1882. It's a pretty amazing painting. If you look at that, look at that tree, look at his, mm -hmm. he's got long hair and a beard because he has taken a Nazarite vow from his youth, never to let a razor touch his head or from the womb, actually, from before he was born. A Nazarite vow was typically like a 30 day vow. You don't touch any wine or mm -hmm. anything made from grapes. You don't touch anything dead. You don't even visit graves of family members and you don't let any razor touch your head but it's typically a 30 day vow. It's described in the, um, I think the book of Exodus, either Exodus mm -hmm. or Numbers, but Samson is a special case. He has a Nazarite vow from conception, from the womb. He's never allowed to touch a dead body. And yet in the story he does. And uh, he is never allowed to cut his hair. And yet in the story, of course, as we all know, he gets his famous haircut from Delilah, which we'll look at in a second. But I'm trying to show kind of in a systematic way the process I went through of seeing this. So Hamlet's Mill got me started thinking about it. And then this story about going down to the woman. So it keeps saying Samson went down to Timnath. He saw a woman and then he went down to Timnath uh, to see this woman. Well, he sees a woman that pleases him well. And his parents are like, can't you find a nice girl from our own people. What do you have to go, you know, date <laughs> a girl from the away. Philistines for? We don't want that. But he's like, nope, she pleases me well. And he goes down to, to uh, he says, look, you got to get her for me. I really want that young woman from the Philistines. But as he's going down to meet her, it says a young lion roared against him and he slays it with his bare hands. He tears it apart as you would tear apart just a baby goat, it says. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but then he goes down and he talks with the woman and she pleases him well. And then it says, after a time, he returned to take her. But wait, before he gets to her, he turns aside to see the carcass of the lion and behold, a swarm of bees and honey in the carcass of the lion. What's going on here? Could it be zodiacal? I, you know, could it be celestial? We'll see. But anyway, he eats the honey. He's not supposed to touch dead bodies. Nazarite vow. He gives some to his parents. Doesn't tell them where he got it because, of course, he got it from a dead body. Not supposed to do that. And then he tells the, the young woman, hey, I'm going to make a riddle 
a riddle. See, and it keeps mentioning a riddle. He's going to turn this into a riddle. He says, you know, if you can come up with the answer, I'll give you 30, this, this whole riddle. Anyway, I'm just underlining a riddle, a riddle, a riddle. Why is that important? Because maybe this whole thing is like a riddle for us to understand. Like, yes. hey, can you figure this out? Can you, can you solve the problem? This riddle and uh, the, the woman, his lover, kind of, um, he, he makes a bet with her people, the Philistines, I guess her cousins and brothers and uncles. And he says, can you tell me the name that out of the eater, you know, I uh, came forth meat, out of the strong came forth something sweet. And they're like, oh, that's weird. And she, and, and they're like, why don't you get him to tell you? And she, she, she bothers him and, <laughs> and uh, pesters him until he tells her the answer. And then she tells them, and then he's really furious when they have the answer mm -hmm. to the riddle. But if we think of it as like, could it be a riddle for us? Here's the Zodiac. I'm trying to make it applicable. I'm, I chose this one because it was so transformational for me, but yeah. I think it really shows it. So this is a Zodiac diagram from the 1600s. They happen to arrange it clockwise. Obviously it's just paper. You could arrange it counterclockwise. Maybe um, some people are more familiar with it going around counterclockwise, but this diagram is going around clockwise. So starting with Aries, Taurus, Gemini, but I use this diagram. I made this all the way back in like 2012, 2013, the top, days longer than nights, heaven, promised land, Greece. This is part of a, a, a system. Like the Philistines represent, it's like tensions between two peoples. It's not actually literal. This is about the interplay of light and dark throughout the year, the interplay of summer and winter. That's what's going on in all these stories, like the Trojan War, the Greeks versus the Trojans. Anyway, going around the top, as we get to the top, top for the northern hemisphere that's the longest day in between gemini and cancer at the very tip top is the summer solstice then going back down remember samson was going down to meet a woman there's leo there's virgo going around i'll just put them in all your viewers are probably familiar because you know the zodiac very well libra scorpio sagittarius we get down to the very bottom that would be the december solstice which for the northern hemisphere is winter shortest day longest for the southern hemisphere capricorn aquarius it's interesting to see how they depicted them in ancient or mm. not ancient but 1600s this is like 1609 um, so that outline if we put the story that we just read into it he went down to meet a woman but on the way to meeting the woman he ran into a lion right mm. so he's coming down like the sun is heading down towards the equinox and then we're going to go into the lower half of the year where days start to become shorter than nights but on our way down we're going to see that beautiful woman the virgin but we run into a lion okay lion take care of the lion get to the woman she pleases him well then after a time he comes back mm. We go all the way around the cycle. <laughs> he comes back and he says, I'm going to go meet her again. But wait, let me check out the lion. And before he gets to meet her, he says, wait a minute, there's honey in this lion. There's bees, a swarm of bees in the lion. What's going on? Well, cancer, the crab is right before the lion. Does cancer have anything to do with bees? Well, you know, astrology may not associate cancer with bees, but in the sky, this is the region of the sky with cancer, the crab. I'm going to show it to you. I'll make it a little brighter. There's the outlines. You can see a lion to the left. There's Orion that we were looking at. He's kind of off to the right. There's Gemini. Remember I said you could just barely see their feet in the other one. Mm -hmm. So after Gemini comes, of course, cancer. So that's cancer. The outstretched arms are like the claws of the crab. And there's Leo. So this is that part of the sky when the sun goes through, when it's going through Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. And in the head of Cancer, right between those outstretched arms and the two inner stars of the outstretched arms, Cancer is a pretty faint sign. Here's how I find it. If you go from the mouth of the lion over to Gemini, they're pretty bright. 
Leo is pretty bright in the sky. And Gemini, the twins, they're Castor and Pollux, those two stars, very bright in the yeah. sky. Cancer, very faint. So you can see if you know how to find Leo, if you go from his mouth over to Gemini, just as I just sketched it out, about halfway across that line is where Cancer is. And if you go kind of, I call it down mm -hmm. towards the horizon, um, this is Northern Hemisphere centric, but if you go down about halfway along that line, down a little bit, you will find this brilliant, dazzling little cluster of stars that's called the Beehive Cluster. It's Messier or Messier Object 47. So it has a astro nominal designation of M47. I'm going to blow it up a little bigger so people can see it. Can you see that little cluster in between the right there? That Very circle? faint, but yes. Mm -hmm. And you can see it with the naked eye. So if you huh. look along that line, your eye can perceive, oh, there's something there. And then if you pu pull out a pair of binoculars or a telescope, it's gorgeous. It's really gorgeous. But that's the beehive. It's in front of the mouth of what constellation? Leo, yeah. the lion. Yeah. So there's bees and honey in front of the mouth of the lion. He goes back to the lion. He finds bees and honey in the mouth. And there's lots. This is the only, you know, as I was putting these together, I just grabbed one picture. But there's, there's lots of ancient depictions of lions with a little bee coming out of their mouth. Goodness. This is one. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. This is an ancient depiction. So why is that? Because there's beehive cluster right in front of Leo the lion. And that's the explanation for this story of Samson going down. Is this starting to make sense? So much sense. Yeah. And I'll just show a little bit I can bit imagine more. the scales falling from your eyes as you looked into <sighs> this more and more. It would have been like, wow mind blown like, uh oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think maybe these authors of hamlet because they don't even talk about what i just talked about that part is mm -hmm. not in hamlet's mill they just talk about the the jawbone mm -hmm. but here's samson getting his famous haircut these are different art artists down through the centuries this is giovanni francesco barbieri who's known as guercino and um that was his nickname, but he's mostly known by that name, 1591 to 1666. So this is like early to mid 1600s, this was painted. But look at kind of the depiction of Delilah there. And then there's the, you know, Samson's enemies. It's Dr. So, Evil up in the background, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, Dr. Evil, that's right. <laughs> yeah, well, his hand gestures are actually celestial clues too. Um, uh -huh. all, these, all these depictions, have, look, she's got in it in one hand, she's got a pair of scissors. What she got in the other hand, a little tuft of his yeah. hair. Mm -hmm. He's already cut off a little of his hair. So here's another one. This one I like a lot. I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this one. This is by Joseph or Joseph or Joseph. I don't know how to say it. It's Czech, Vorlicek or Vorlicek, 1800s, 1824 to 1897. Mm. And you can see. Some similarities to the last one, for one thing. You know, there's the soldiers getting ready. See, in the story, Samson, he has this tremendous strength because his hair has never been cut because he's obeying this Nazarite vow. But Delilah has been told, hey, we've got to find out the, the source of his strength. So and Samson's Delilah, always falling in love. Yeah, can I ahead. ask, she's not the woman that he went down to see. That was a different woman. Correct, yeah. yeah. And, so he has a great time get, with the ladies, doesn't yeah, he? <laughs> he does. When we get to when we get to the course, we'll do the whole full Samson story mm -hmm. properly. But yes, mm -hmm. that poor woman was burned alive along with her father at, shortly after the incident of the riddle. So, mm -hmm. uh, and that's why Samson burned up the crops um, yes. with the foxes, and yes. then he got tied up, and then uh, you know, in punishment for. They wanted to punish him for burning the crops, so they tied him up, and then he burst those bonds, grabbed the jawbone of an ass, killed a thousand, threw the jawbone away, uh, you know, drank out of it, threw it away. It's all celestial metaphors, not literal, mm. but it's telling us something true. It's not, I'm not making fun of it. No, that's no. what I want. That's what I want people to understand. This is profound metaphor, but you have to understand the language that it's speaking. So then it says he meets a harlot 
in Gaza, i.e. a prostitute, and um, they try and sneak in to get him while he's with the prostitute, but he walks away with like the gates of the city and uh, carries them off. And then finally he meets Delilah. He falls in love with Delilah in the valley of um, oh, uh, Sadok or Zadok. I forget the name of the valley, but she's in a valley. This is celestial. The name of the valley doesn't really matter. I know where it is in the heavens, mm -hmm. but they give it all different names. It's the, the terrain that they're talking about is different parts of the night sky. Anyway, so he falls in love with Delilah. He really likes Delilah. And she's the only one who gets a name out of his, out of the different lovers that he meets. And she is working for the Philistines to try and figure out the source. They're like, this Samson guy is a problem. Can you please find out his secret? And she says, Samson, dear, can you please tell me how to um, defeat your great strength and, you know, so that you can be defeated and subdued? And he's like, um, I don't want to tell you that. And so he tells her, he tells her different lies about it. He says, well, if you tie me up with grand, green withs or withs or withes, which people don't even know exactly what it means, but it's probably like bowstrings yeah. made out of the gut of an animal or something while they're still green and moist, um, then I'll be as ordinary men. And then, of course, what does she do? She does it. She ties him up with those and he bursts out and he's like, ha ha, that's not what it really was. And he bursts out. So then she asks him again. And he says, well, if you tie me up with ropes that have never been tied on any other man, then I won't be able to break out of them. What does she do? Does she that? ties them up with it. Like you would think When's at he this gonna... point, he's like, yeah, this <laughs> woman up? does not actually have my best interest in heart because every time <laughs> I tell her something, she does it. Uh, and then she calls the Philistines. And then I have to like burst out. But of course... Finally, he gives in and tells her, actually, it's because the hair of my head has never been cut. And if you do, I'll just become as an ordinary man. And she says, okay, now I can call the soldiers because now I think this is really it. Uh, the other time, he says another one where it's tie my hair into the, weave it into a loom. All these are celestial um, references. A loom is definitely associated with specific constellations. Um, in a specific part of the heavens, but I'm not going to go into that right here. But finally she says, okay, now I know this is it. And she calls the soldiers and then he falls asleep in her lap, it says. And you can see in this picture, he's falling asleep in her lap. And she calls someone else. In the first painting, she was doing the cutting, but in, in the text, it says she calls a man to cut his hair. That's obviously not a man that she's calling in this painting. They took a little artistic license since a woman. Another, you know, the beautiful haircutters are giving Samson his haircut. It looks like he's already had a haircut, frankly. It's not very mm, long. But, yeah. Um, let's look at this painting because I really love the celestial features in here. But um, I'm going to pull in the constellations in the night sky, different part of the night sky. So this is centered around the Milky Way, a very important part of the night sky. And I'll just bring that painting back in. So this is by Joseph Warlicek. And I've actually flipped it. So the painting, I flipped it left and right. Mm -hmm. Painters sometimes do things reversed from the heavens, but to make it really clear, I flipped it. So just in full disclosure, this painting from the 1800s is clearly using celestial metaphor. Can you see any possible, I don't know, celestial, Yes, I can. In here? <laughs> what I can because I've done your courses. So I, I'm mm. assuming in this case, is it possible that the lady with the scissors is Sagittarius? I mean, why would you say such a thing? Because <laughs> it looks like she's got her hand out with the scissors a bit like yeah. that. Yeah. And am I right or scissors. am I wrong? <laughs> what do you see underneath her scissors that the artist has put in some little props? underneath is there anything underneath oh, straight under her hand. and a pot yeah yeah there's a pot which what constellation in the zodiac would have a pot like that probably aquarius probably aquarius yes. like the water yes. pitcher but yes the arrows who would arrows be associated with oh sagittarius sagittarius yeah. i mean the very name sagittarius means 
archer. Mm. The Latin word for an arrow was sagitta. So she, she's got arrows right underneath her and her actual outline looks like Sagittarius, as we'll see, but you're jumping ahead. No, you asked. With, I know, I know. And very good. You get an A. You get, you get a, a star for that, Ksenia. But um, look at Samson's outline. Could he be associated with any constellations? Like his angle of his body. I'm going to show you a constellation. Look down at the bottom of your screen. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can you see that constellation it's the zodiac constellation of scorpio now look at the angle of scorpio kind of look at the way his feet are like hooked over yeah look at scorpio and so i'm just going to draw the same outline of scorpio on top of mm. because he's lying in the lap of delilah in an angle that i would argue is very mm -hmm. evocative or suggestive of Scorpio yes. and then you're correct so in relationship to Scorpio where's Sagittarius right where that woman with the scissors is I'm going to draw in Sagittarius so look back down at the mm -hmm. bottom of your screen where it says Scorpio Scorpio and Sagittarius are at the base of the Milky Way the brightest part of the Milky mm -hmm. Way the mm -hmm. lowest part at least here in the northern hemisphere as it rises up so this has esoteric significance, the lowest point. This is like one of Samson's lowest points here. Sagittarius, see the outline of Sagittarius? Yeah. Kind of leaning and usually envisioned as holding a bow for shooting arrows with, but there appears to be an ancient tradition in which that bow, it can play other things in different myths. It could be scissors, I don't know. I mean, a really big pair of scissors. It can actually be the shuttle of a loom. If anyone has ever actually done real weaving by hand on a loom, there's a thing called a shuttle that you use to move the thread, thread the yarn. And yeah. And it, it has a shape that's very similar to the way that bow also looks in the sky. So I'm going to draw that same outline over here mm -hmm. of Sagittarius. So notice how Sagittarius relates to Scorpio in the sky. Look at this artist. Is that artist psychic mm -hmm. is that artist clued into this system i have no idea but it's amazing how this plays out and the artist puts in arrows as i already pointed out to say sagittarius look out so whose lap could scorpio be lying in well if you're asking me i would say it's <laughs> probably orion no no mm. not orion sorry start with an o yeah you're <laughs> Thank getting you. it you're, you're kiss, thinking of yes, it. yes. <laughs> A few kiss. So first, let me just point out the Milky Way. So I've, I've drawn in Milky, you know, I put in the, the label Milky Way. But if you look above Scorpio and Sagittarius, there is kind of a pillar with some ivy creeping up the side. But there's mm. also these suggestive clouds in the sky up there. Um, oh, well, I was, I thought I was going to put in the Milky Way label next. There's a few kiss. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, I got a little out of order. Okay. You were right, it is Ophiuchus. So see how Scorpio is reclining just below the feet of Ophiuchus. You could imagine that he's reclining in the lap of Ophiuchus. And that's who I would argue is, in this case, Delilah mm -hmm. is, is giving him his haircut or calling for the haircut or yes. as he's lying in her lap. Can you see that? And then here's the outline. I just did it in a different color because it kind of overlaps. In mm -hmm. the sky, it doesn't overlap, but in this artist's rendition, He's kind of moved them a little closer together for dramatic effect. But there's the Milky Way. Look at those clouds. I mean, look at the Milky Way. Look at those clouds. Mm -hmm. Look at that pillar with its, with its um, ivy. Actually, I pillars are associated with Ophiuchus. See how Ophiuchus could look like pillars, like mm -hmm. the two vertical lines of Ophiuchus. But the clouds are a real giveaway that we're dealing with the Milky Way. There's other features too. I don't want to, I mean, we've gone a long time already. This is kind of, I'm, it's fascinating. No, it's just fascinating. But it really shows. I mean, are you seeing how? Look, the the paintings don't prove that the Bible is based on the stars. The paintings are done by artists. This one in the 1800s, other ones in the 1600s, whatever. That doesn't prove anything. The text itself proves it. There's all kinds of references in the text. He went down to meet a woman. He ran into a lion. Then he, after a time came back to see her again, but then 
went to see the lion, but then ran in some bees and honey. That's celestial. Mm. The words themselves prove it. But the artists, this is just a fascinating aspect of history that they seem to know. They seem to be using these conventions, these celestial conventions, the clouds of the Milky Way. There's even a castle off to the left of her mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. hand there. That's a that's another constellation. We won't get into it here, but in the courses, we talk about these things. So there's even one more. This is, I didn't even see this until I'd been working with this painting for a long time before I saw the next one. He's kind of leaning his arm on her lap Yes. But do you see there's like a bench? There's like yes. a, a yes. little bench there. Could there be a constellation that's shaped like a bench next to Ophiuchus well, to the right of Scorpio? Yeah, the constellation is Libra there, but... Um, You're so right. Mm. Look at that bench. It's got the Look two, at Libra. two legs like, yes, yes. Mm. I, I would argue that that painter has included some characteristics that are suggestive of the constellation Libra. Mm. And these yeah. are incredibly important constellations. This is an nice. incredibly important part of the sky. This is the zodiac and Ophiuchus. It all has significance in this ancient system. It has to do with what we were talking about in the system. We talk about suppressing the self. That's what I was talking at the very beginning about. Down at the lowest point, where he's getting his hair cut. He's in between, you know, Sagittarius and the bottom of the Milky Way. He's down here near the lowest part of the year. He's getting his hair shorn off, like the rays of the sun are getting shortened <laughs> as we get to the darkest point of the year. Mm. But then the Bible, and then he gets captured by the Philistines. He gets his eyes put out because he's now blind. He's kind of been blind uh metaphorically now he's physically blind blinded they put his eyes out which is you know these things these myths are graphic and mm -hmm. violent and sexual and all these things but they are talking about our situation but then the bible says but then his hair began to grow back you see the we suppress our self it, it, this is kind of a, a showing of like all the foolish things we do when we're divided from self, including like staying with a partner who clearly doesn't have our best interest in mind and keeps oh, demonstrating yes. it, you know, I all know. these things. But anyway, but then his hair begins to grow back and he gets his strength back. These are metaphorical depictions of we, no matter what we've gone through, no matter how foolish we've been, we do have access to that higher realm. And God talks to Samson again. And Samson says, I've been so foolish. Can you just give me back my strength for a little bit? And it, it's, it's a profound story, actually. It's confusing and jumbled and violent and bizarre in some ways when you're just trying to read it literally. But it's actually, it fits into this pattern of trauma and recovery. Mm. It's an illustration. So that's that's kind of my last um, slide for the stars and things. But I'm just trying to show, when I say the Bible is based on the stars, this is present in all of the myths. Samson isn't necessarily the clearest one. It's kind of a crazy, wild story. Some of them are very, very clear and very um, obvious that they're talking about higher self and recovery of self. So this is the Celestial Bible Tour Part 1 that I've just released that... Mm. Um, I really appreciate your letting me come on and, and talk about it. We've already talked about the foundations courses, so I'll just stop the slideshow and we can go back to. Uh, yeah, this is fantastic. So, talking. yeah. So, that is just amazing. I mean, like, is that convincing? My, it's so convincing. My eyes are like opened yet again to um, a different way to look at the skies and a different way to look at the myths. And it's so empowering. Like you said, the. The lessons in that story regarding, uh, you know, the mistakes we make as humans, staying with someone, like you said, or, um, you know, not being sceptical enough where maybe we should be a bit sceptical, you know, things like that, that there's just so much richness in these stories. And, and I love 
what you've done in sharing this. And I, I agree, it's so massive to be exploring the Bible that, you know, you do need a few different sections, otherwise it's just overwhelming. So um, joining David for his first Celestial Bible tour is going to open your eyes no end. But he also has two other courses, which he's talked about. And if you use the code from um, from uh, Guiding Star Astrology website, then you can get a discount on those courses as well, um, which might be a great foray into David's work. But really, this Celestial Bible Tour, for people who are familiar with the Bible and want a different perspective on it, this is the one for you. So there's a link in the description below. Head there and check it out, and you will not regret for a moment that um, you've followed David's work here. And if you want to follow along with David's other work, he does, he has a, a number of YouTube videos, um, and his his um, website is starmythworld.com. Do check that out as well. There's a, like a plethora of articles there, all about these fascinating topics. David, as always, it's been amazing to have you here on the Guiding Star channel. And we always learn so much when you come on, uh, on board here. So thank you for your time and for this amazing information today. Well, thank you so much, Ksenia. I really appreciate the opportunity to get this message out to someone who might really benefit from it. So, um, you know, I appreciate just your curiosity and interest. And I appreciate anyone's interest in these topics that I am exploring. But I always say, why wouldn't you be interested in this stuff? I mean, it's, it's like it was given to, it was given to our ancestors. Mm. And it's this ancient treasure that we have preserved for us in the myths. So I'm uh, really excited to share it, obviously. And and I love how it fits in, how you've related Know Thyself to what you do and what you're teaching in the Royal Stars Academy to yeah. what I'm doing. It's all about knowing yourself so that we can live up to our full potential and help others. Exactly. Exactly. Help others to know themselves as well. Well, thank you, David. It has been a joy and we look forward to having you back again with more amazing knowledge of the heavens at some point in the future. But in the meantime, everybody, check out David's the link to David's courses and sign up. <laughs>